Uh, but I'm going to speak more from the manager slash trader perspective. So it is really, I'm going to present a couple different ways to measure a uh, manager's ability to maximize the return uh, per unit of risk. So as a man, I was going to, uh, I'll get into my background in a second, but the reality is I spent 16 years as a proprietary trader in Chicago, launched a CTA in February of last year. We now have uh, close to 150 million in AUM, but like any new manager, the first six months of meetings, et cetera, it was, I was surprised at how many times I ran into uh, a wall with the simple sharp ratio or Sortino ratio that, that is so easily cited. And, and so from a manager's perspective at least, you know, basically the conclusion I'll start with is that you know, absolute return strategies are very often measured uh, by the outperformance to some industry benchmark, or as Marat said, institutional investors only want to give money to someone they trust with the credibility and a very long track record or significant amount of AUM under, under management, or just straight up, where's your sharp or Sortino? Uh, I was fortunate three months into the search to meet with a $10 million fund that I, if I threw the name out, you'd know quite well, but was told very clearly that, you know, unless we had a 24-month track record at one point of a sharp, there was no reason to have a further discussion. And so it, it just struck me as surprising that we wouldn't dig into a little, some other metrics as to one real question, how does this manager or how does this strategy maximize the actual return per unit of risk? So, Back to my background and, and where the maximized maternity risk may come from. Uh, I, I spent 16 years as a prop trader, so you kind of you grow up under the mindset of don't have a losing month and, 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 and generate steady returns. I was fortunate to work for a significant amount of time with a, a macro trader who worked under Michael Steinhardt, who worked with Steve Cohen. So I kind of had, had the luxury of playing, playing ball with a, a Phil Mickelson, Tiger Woods, if you will, for a long time. So my strategies in style, although built in, in systems that we, we had back tested and, and looked at, was based upon a, a macro understanding of what's really driving the markets because the, the cycles change over time. So we launched, uh, eventually our, the, our plans got bigger than, the, than the, the local Chicago firm, and we launched with a, a couple simple goals to uh, you know, maximize the return per unit of risk, generate highly uncorrelated returns, and execute with time frames that were above the high frequency space. but but below the very long-term, multi-month uh, trend followers. And uh, so we came with two products. Uh, one is a, is a fully systematic S&P model uh, that, that generates revenue in a time period that's more difficult for our macro overlay. At the time, when we pulled the trigger to launch in February 2014, it was a period where trend followers hadn't made money for multiple years, and, and we really felt we were bringing to market something that would add a lot of alpha to portfolios. And I'd even said in meetings and said, the reality is you want a couple, you want this S&P strategy and you want it to do poorly because it means all the other stuff that you have is going to do quite well. Uh, and and as, it, as it was, uh, the strategy did, did break down a little bit right after July when the euro began to, uh, to run, but still generated positive returns. And this year uh, is up roughly 700 uh, basis points year to date, uh, whereas the trend following stuff it's done really well in Jan, but, but as many of the guys have given back their money over the last uh, 45 months. So that's kind of my background and where our thought process has, comes from. When we build strategies and identify things, we're looking, uh, I come at it from a macro understanding and try to make sure that we have things that work in multiple different environments. Um, and so back to again, the sharp measurement is just a, just a measurement of consistency, not really risk. Uh, you know this, I'm sure. The Sortino measures the risk adjusted returns relative to, to the downside. And again, too many meetings I said in where the industry benchmarks uh, were the target. So as an alternative, I'm going to focus on two things today. But, but we like to measure a return per unit of, of actual risk. Uh, John Nettle will get into the importance of the, of the actual risk and, and draw down a lot into the manager itself. Capital use, at least for CTAs, is a big deal, less so for hedge funds. Uh, but, you know, a manager that does, ten, two managers that do 10% and one uses 2% margin and one uses 20, there's a, obviously a very different return profile, uh, as well as just the return per product. Those are, those are common, and I'm sure each of you, in some metric, I don't know how many here are allocators versus managers, but I'm sure they're used in some metric of yours. But the big blind spots to me, now that we've been successful raising some assets and, and have traded over a significant period of time, blind spots are, are just uh, a lack of attention to correlation and then more expensive, more uh, importantly, regime. Now, regime is something I'll get into, but that's the, the real takeaway 
I would hope that you take from from me is uh, is the way to incorporate regime identification into the way you measure sharks. And by each of these, we could play some. We could effectively take the sharp ratio and divide it by correlation, uh, or the sharp ratio and divide it by regime performance. And what you're going to end up getting is uh, you basically readjust these traditional metrics. So correlation. There's a very high correlation within just about any category. Uh, the next slide, I'll go back to it. But I took, back to what uh, Rod said, there's a, there's a high emphasis by institutional allocators to give money to those that have a significant amount of AUM or have been around for a while. So I wouldn't grab any CTA off of IAS, IASG that, uh, that, that, that lists trend following at all in their components of, of strategy. We can, uh, we can do this with long short equity. We can do this with a number of different strategies and has at least 100 million under management and has been around for 15 years, meeting all the criteria that an institutional manager would look for. And in a benchmark, I list the, the actual CTAs below, but not the names up top, just for the purpose of this presentation. But, and what you see is uh, all the red boxes are two CTAs that are highly correlated to each other. The basic conclusion is that if we pick a category of managers and there are 30 to 100 managers within it, the fact is most of them are highly correlated to each other. So again, let's see. There's a high, there's a high correlation within a, within a category, so to me, the strategy should be rewarded for their lack of correlation. And so we, we can, I didn't add it into the presentation, but if we wanted to get into the mathematics behind it, adjusting the sharp through a number of different metrics for the correlation to the blend you're trying to gain exposure to, actually uh, is a far more effective way to, uh, to utilize those metrics. So the problem is, is pretty simple. And modern portfolio theory for most in here is an easy understanding that too much correlation in one you know, increases the, the, the risk of the portfolio for excessive volatility and, and lack of return. So if you started from a lower correlation basket of managers in a space that you're trying to replicate, uh, it's a far more effective tool to build a portfolio using the traditional metrics. Now, regime recognition. That is something that, that we use the term at Bluegrass Capital. It's something I've used forever because, again, as I grew up as a more or less a macro overlay to, to shorter term patterns, the fact is, uh, you know, market cycles change. There are some factors may work over time, but the market conditions themselves can significantly affect the relative performance. Anyone who backtested a strategy prior to QE doesn't have anything in the model that incorporated the impact that, that such action would have. So, and there, are, there is another amount of uncertainty to come in the future. So without factoring what the regimes are today, the regime is a, we, we define them on our internal metric based upon the time frames that are relevant to us. If I was a manager, I'd do them on a slightly higher, if I was a portfolio manager, I do, uh, I do them on a slightly higher time frame of, of months and quarters so that I can effectively define is this an environment that favors volatility, that favors trends, that favors reversion, that favors carry? What, what is the regime that's in the marketplace right now? So I, mean, I like to call it money ball because that's basically what it is. If, you know, if a guy's bet 400, uh, and that's his batting average. There's no, there's no promise that he's going to hit 400 for the next month. It depends, for the most part, on what the market environment is. Uh, I'm sure if you are an allocator, you've probably called up your manager in good times and bad and asked why they're doing so well or not. And often the response would be, you know, probably bragging about something they did well. But more importantly, it's a function of the market environment that fits that particular strategy. So what we do at Bluegrass, it's something that anyone could do as an allocator themselves, is define a set of factors, much in the same way that Marat listed a set of factors. Uh, define a set of factors, and if I used them in a, in a factor model of five, then, you know, then when scenario one, two, three, four, five is true versus when scenario two, three, four, five, one is true, et cetera, we can run that as a regression against the manager's performance over time, and you actually begin to find out which managers outperform in certain regimes, and within, again, within that category of managers, the trend following bucket, if it will, or long short equity, whatever, whatever category it is you're trying to replicate. It is far more important to impact, to, to overweight and to score 
the manager's performance uh, based upon those regimes. So if we get into, because the improper regime recognition I noted may negatively skew the return profile itself, and so again, we, we adjust the sharp to favorable conditions. So I did a few things trying to keep it simple for the purpose of this, uh, of this presentation, using the same funds that we had in the trend following basket. And the top left box would be the average annualized return of the blend itself and the sharp ratio of those. Whereas if we grabbed the uh, lower correlated strategies to the bottom 20% and created a, a, uh, a blend of those, we get a significantly higher sharp ratio, even though those on an individualized basis, none of those had anything, had, had, us, had anything special in terms of the sharp itself. Then in the bottom, in the bottom two, strong trending regime, weak trending regime, again, to keep this, this simple. At, at Bluegrass, we use a number of different factors to define the regime itself, and can get into that during the Q&A. But for the purpose of this, identifying when it was a strong trending regime and when it was a weak trending regime, obviously the basket that we chose for this presentation, you'd expect to do well when the environment was right and poorly when it was not. But again, choosing the, the manager based upon having some low correlation to the blend yet still a reasonable short, you get much greater outperformance uh, when the environment was poor. Then, uh, on the right side, we said, uh, so how, how can the regime performance uniquely add value to the portfolio itself? So of that same basket from the first correlation matrix, we took, I took two funds that were not in the top 20% of sharps of, those, of that basket and assessed them in a strong trading regime versus weak. And the fact is, what you find, these, the funds that perform well in a weak trading regime, you would want to have some exposure to them in your portfolio itself. Because obviously you're mostly trying to protect the unit of risk itself and the max downside. So, we, and I can get into the regime recognition on you know, any Q&A, uh, et cetera. But the main, the main takeaway is that, you know, from a, from a person who been in the business a long time and had, had and, and, and gone from the manager side and we've been able to raise a fair bit of money, I was shocked at the, at the actual, at the meetings on the initial outset, how much attention there was to Sharp and Sortino itself. So identifying how often a manager is and shouldn't be determined by the Sharp and Sortino and a portfolio that maximizes the true return of risk uh, can be done by readjusting those traditional metrics or simply incorporating correlation and more importantly regime. It's something that we use on our internal strategies and something that a portfolio manager can do as well. Try to keep it short and sweet. Any, any questions now or I think there's a Q&A after for all, is that correct?